if you'll listen fast, I'll preach fast, and uh, we'll get you out of here. I noticed there is a fire extinguisher underneath the pulpit. <laughs> so it, it, it wasn't your church theme at one time, preaching the truth uh, in love on fire, or speaking the truth in love on fire, and I know what he's talking about now. So it's either one of two things. Either, either number one, he just preaches with so much fire every time he preaches that you've got to put the fire out on the pulpit. Or number two, that's what he uses if you fall asleep in the afternoon service. <laughs> okay, so since I don't know for sure, I'm going to assume that's what we use if you fall asleep during the afternoon <laughs> service. Okay, so uh, we'll see what happens. First Corinthians chapter number 15. Let's stand together. And we're going to begin reading at the end of the chapter, towards the end of a uh, long chapter there, 1 Corinthians 15. It is a blessing to be here with you, and I uh, have enjoyed it, and uh, just a privilege to have the opportunity to preach in Brother Grice's pulpit, and I love him and his family, and uh, just good to have preacher friends that are just down to earth, and uh, he's, 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 he's off a little bit, but it's, it's good to have friends that are off a little bit, and they know how to laugh, and they know how to have a good, uh, a good time. And uh, the thing about my wife's hair that I like is when it smells like Mexican food, I get to chew on it. Yeah. And uh, you all don't get to. So, and, uh, so that thing about being away from my own church, I did get a text a minute ago. And I was telling someone earlier that it was wonderful uh, seeing the fellow get saved this morning. And, and I don't know about your church, but it just, it's, it's not normal anymore. It seems like to have adults uh, willing to walk a church aisle and say, hey, I need to be born again. Uh, a lot of folks get saved after church and, and different times, but having adults walk the aisle anymore, it just, I don't know, it just seems like it's, unless you walk them down the aisle because you led them to Christ or whatever. Uh, but I got a text that we had two adults saved this morning and uh, one uh, child, we have, a, we have a drive-in church and a bus church. And then we have that adult and teen service. And uh, so, yeah, I probably won't be asked back uh, because they had revival and I wasn't there. So, uh, but, uh, and I do that too. Every once in a while, I'll put somebody up who I know is going to lay an egg. And I'm just joking. And, uh, but anyways, this young man's a Bible college student and does great, loves the Lord, and God's, God's really using him. So I'm going to preach there tonight. We're going to go back home and preach this evening at 6 o'clock. So if you're not tired of preaching yet, just drive an hour. If you ever get out to Lake Tawakany, Lake Fork, we're out in that area there. Love to have you come by and visit if you're out on vacation or something. First Corinthians 15, verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. That's the nursery theme verse right there. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, the strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I want to preach on that one word out of verse number 58, unmovable. Therefore, my beloved brethren, so we're talking to save folks, uh, because of the rapture, be ye steadfast, unmovable. Let's pray. Lord, would you bless our time together this afternoon. Speak to our hearts, we pray, and we'll thank you for what you do in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Paul is writing here to the church at Corinth. Uh, he's reminding them and us under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost of God of the rapture. And uh, thank God for the rapture. Uh, earlier on in this passage, in 1 Corinthians 15, in this chapter, Paul is writing to Sadducees and others who didn't believe in a rapture, didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. And he says, if Christ is not risen from the dead, uh, then uh, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we're of all men most miserable. But then he goes on to tell them, but Christ is risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them uh, that slept. And so he goes on to, to tell them about the rapture and describe the rapture uh, to them. I mentioned this morning, uh, it just kind of came to mind, I guess. Uh, this world is not our home. We're just a passing through. Our treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. There in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, that great hall of faith, those saints of God, 
The Bible says about them that they uh, confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims here on earth, that they, they sought another country, they sought a city uh, that was to come. And you and I are looking for that country. Uh, you and I are going to get to see that place called heaven one day at the moment of the rapture. So we're looking forward to uh, the rapture, Titus 2.13, looking for that blessed hope and the, uh, the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Think about it, when Jesus steps out on the clouds, and by the way, I'd much rather go in the rapture than go by a nuclear bomb. I mean, if we all went at once, that'd be great. But wouldn't it be better if, if the Lord just stepped on the clouds, out on the clouds today and uh, called us home? We're, we're all going out into eternity one day, uh, either by rapture or by a rupture. But one way or another, uh, we're, we're leaving here. When the Lord steps out on the clouds, uh, we're going to receive sinless bodies. We have no clue what that even feels like. To, 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 not, to not have any desires of the flesh, to not battle the, the lust of the flesh, and, and to live in a, in a sinless world, in a, a sinless body, we, we, we can't even begin to think uh, because we were born sinners, sinners by birth and uh, sinners by choice. But one day, when we get to heaven, we will have sinless bodies. Not only that, when we get to heaven one day, we will receive perfectly healthy bodies. Perfectly healthy bodies. Isn't that a blessing? When you don't need any more cast uh, on your legs, want to be a blessing, Brother O'Neill, when you're up out of that wheelchair and, then, and it'll look back to just a little bit of time in your life. And I was with Brother uh, O'Neill in school years ago. And, uh, and, and what, a, what a great day uh, that's going to be when he has a perfectly healthy body. Want to be wonderful when you don't wake up and your back hurts and your head hurts and, and you have to put those contacts in or those glasses on and you have to pay for those prescriptions. I, I had to go this week for my annual physical and uh, last year was my first ever annual physical and when I left... Uh, I, I didn't want to go back for a long, long time uh, to that physical. And uh, they put me on a little bit of blood pressure medicine. My goal has always been to put people on blood pressure medicine, not to have to be put on it, but they did. And, uh, and I went back this, uh, this week and had the checkup and all of that junk, and, and I guess everything's fine. Uh, but, friend, listen, one day, and it was costly. I don't have insurance. It was costly. And uh, one day we won't have to worry about any more hospitals, any more doctor's bills, any more Obamacare, uh, any more funeral homes, uh, any of that kind of stuff, because we're going to receive perfectly healthy bodies. And we're going to receive one day eternal bodies. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5 that we know that if this house were dissolved, we have a building of God uh, not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. We know that one day we're going to be absent from this body and present uh, with the Lord. We know that one day we'll get to see the Lord face to face because First John 3 tells us that one day we shall see him uh, <clears throat> as he is. So Paul tells the church at Corinth about the glory of the rapture and begins to describe that to them in the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Excuse me. So he tells them again, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 tells us that uh, we don't have to sorrow over the death of loved ones as others which have no hope. We weep, our hearts are broken, and certainly it hurts us, but it's a different kind of sorrow when you know that loved one knew Jesus Christ as their personal Savior because the Bible says that one day uh, the Lord's going to step out on the clouds uh, with, with the, uh, with the uh, trump of God and he's going to uh, call us home and the dead in Christ shall rise first and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air to meet the Lord uh, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air so shall we ever be with the Lord. All right, so we're just waiting on that moment. We believe in God's timeline. There's nothing else left uh, but the rapture. We don't, we're not waiting on any other certain age or dispensation. We're not waiting on any other major event. All we're waiting on is the trumpet to sound. And, uh, and we finally leave this old sinful world. We finally get done paying bills. Finally get done paying doctors. Finally get done with the heartaches and the headaches and all of that stuff uh, of this life. Now, Paul tells them, he starts 1 Corinthians 15, giving them the gospel. And then he begins to tell them what the grace of God did for him. 
And then he says, how can you say there is no resurrection of the dead and that Christ is not risen? He said, Christ is risen and we are going to uh, be with him one day, those that are saved. And he describes a rapture and tells in a twinkling of an eye, in a moment, how quickly the rapture can, can occur. And then he turns to the Christians and he says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be a steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Well, when he puts that word therefore, when there's a wherefore or a therefore in the Bible, you find out what it's there for. So because we get the gift of eternal life, because this world is not our home, because one day we get to go home to be with Jesus, because one day you get an eternal body, a sinless body, a body that does not die, a body that does not get sick, he says, because of all of this, because the Lord could step out on the clouds at any time, therefore, because of that, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So we ought to abound in our service to Christ while here on earth. Now, God designed it so that we serve him through our local church. Now, it's one thing to give to the fire department. It's one thing to give to uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, multi, the, uh, what, what, the, uh, I forget Jerry Lewis, the telethon and the, the, the thing that he used to do on, on Labor Day. And it's, it's one thing to go, uh, maybe, uh, volunteer at the local school or, or to give to the Red Cross or things like that. But friend, God designed it so that we serve Christ through the local New Testament church that he bled and died for. And don't give all of your time and energy and effort and money to things outside of the church and then give nothing inside of the church. The Bible talks about in Ephesians 4 and verse 16, speaking of the church and how God gave a church a pastor and, and gives church, uh, uh, churches teachers and, and, and for the perfecting of the saints, the work of the ministry, the edifying of the body of Christ. And he says in Ephesians 4, 16, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted, listen, by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of Every part maketh increase of the body under the edifying of itself in love. All right, so we're to build one another up. And not only build one another up spiritually, but the church will grow numerically when everyone is doing their part. When everyone is getting involved in the work of the local church. Now, we'll not, we're not going to serve Christ properly unless we're unmovable. We have preacher friends that will go from church to church to church about every two years. And, and, and they're never established and they never build relationships. And, and they, uh, they, they don't get to see, it seems like it takes 10 years to really see the fruit of, of your specific ministry. And, and, and they miss out on the joys. And friend, listen, God never designed it. Uh, so that we, uh, you know, constantly are quitting something and constantly uh, changing. In fact, the Word of God tells us, meddle not with them that are given to change. So God says in his word, all right, the rapture could take place at any moment. There's a lot of good things to look forward to in the rapture. Because of that, therefore, my beloved brethren, be a steadfast, unmovable. Unmovable. That's not teaching us to be stubborn, I know a lot of stubborn people, a couple of them are probably up here on the platform right now. That doesn't mean, I shall not be, I shall not be moved. You're not going to change my mind. You're gonna, not going to make me do anything I don't want to do. That's not what it's talking about. Unmovable, to, me, to move, to be moved means to change. Too many today are moved from clean living to sinful living. Many are moved from God's will to personal plans. Some are moved from ministering in the local church to just sitting and taking up space in the local church. And then some are moved from church to church to church. I heard a preacher, Brother Joe Arthur, say this just a, a, a few weeks ago. He, he pastors out in Georgia, and he said, he said I, I, I've had a lot of people come to my church over the years. He said, but I've had far more come through my church over the years. And think about that for a moment. God brought you to this church, and, and I don't believe in a year's time or six months' time, God wants to bring you through this church. I don't believe God's in the jump from place to place to place to place 
to ministry to ministry in the local church. God says, all right, I'm coming back one day. And there's a lot of good things to look forward to when I do come back. Okay, and so until that day, I want you to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, going overboard in your service to God for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. It's not empty. It's not worthless. It's not useless. He says, hey, stay busy, but we won't stay busy if we don't stay put. Someone said, bloom where you're planted. So how, how to be unmovable? To serve Christ properly, I must be unmovable. So let me give you three ways to be unmovable. Turn with me, if you would, to Psalm 1, a familiar psalm to most, if not all of us in here. Psalm 1, and that's where I want to take these three points from. Preacher, how can I be unmovable? The Bible says in Psalm 1, Blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate both day and night. He should be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Uh, that tree planted by the rivers of water, uh, bringing fruit and, and the leaf not withering, and, and the tree prospering, that's speaking of an unmovable tree. Uh, that goes back to the song we sing. Just like a tree planted by the waters, Lord, I shall not be moved. Again, that doesn't mean stubbornness. Uh, that means surrender. That means staying put. That means uh, I'm going to be unmovable. I'm going to stay where I'm supposed to stay. The Bible says in Jeremiah 17 and verse 7, Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters and that spreadeth out her roots by the river and shall not see when heat cometh, but her leaves shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding uh, fruit. That speaks of a tree planted by waters being a healthy tree, a producing tree being an unmovable tree. So how to be unmovable? How, how do we stay in the same place for a period of time. I realize that there comes a time when God moves people. Sometimes it's ministry, folks, that God moves. My dad started our church in 1983, in the spring of 83, summer of 83, and we celebrate our church anniversary the same week you guys do. And, and, uh, and after 17 years there, my dad resigned and, 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 and took a church in Fort Worth. And the pastor there, the old pastor there, had asked my dad before, a few years before then, would you come, uh, Brother Ogden, would you come and take this church? He was ready to retire. At that time, my, my dad didn't do it. He didn't believe it was God's leading. He didn't do it. But a few years later, they had gone through another pastor there. That old man uh, went back and had to kind of uh, fill, fill a slot there for a while. He called my dad again. He said, Brother Ogden, would you please come? And uh, my dad considered it then and prayed about it and went. And, and the church voted him in. And, and sometimes God moves people. Sometimes God moves uh, church families. Uh, sometimes uh, there, there's a reason uh, for that. But, but, but all in all, how can we stay in the same place for a long period of time? H how can we look up and believe the same things 10 and 15 and 20 years from now? Uh, because of social media, we see folks, we see young people who were raised right and raised in the right kind of church and and, but, and they strayed, and today they, they flaunt their sin. They, they flaunt their lack of church. They, they, they flaunt their bad relationship uh, with the Lord. So how do I look up and, and, and as a young person, 14, 15 years old, how do you look up at 25 and you're still where you're supposed to be? You're unmovable. How do we live the same way years from now? Let me give you three things out of Psalm 1, three thoughts. Number one is this. What does it take to be unmovable? Number one, personal separation. Yep. Personal separation. Blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. We have to have some personal separation. Walking with the wrong crowd will get you in trouble every time. By the way, even in church, there could be the wrong crowd. If there's a crowd in church criticizing the decisions that are made, it's always easy to sit back and criticize uh, when someone else is doing the work. 
and we get around the crowd that's negative, and we get around the crowd that wants to talk about everybody, and, and we get around the crowd that says, well, we've been thinking about leaving. Oh, we've been thinking about leaving also. Listen, you're not going to be unmovable unless you get away from that crowd. Psalm 1, or not Proverbs 1 rather, warns us, and we always attribute it to teenagers, but really it's for all of us. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. And it goes on to say, if they tell you, come with us, let us, let's do this, and, and let's do that. And, 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 and Solomon said to his son, he said, walk not thou in the way with them. He said, get away from that crowd. The wrong counsel will get us in trouble. Uh, blessed is the man, happy is the man, so happy is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Hey, we need counsel in our life. Uh, in the multitude of counselors, there is safety, but not the wrong kind of counsel. I, 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 not the wrong kind. Someone out of church, and you're trying to get them to, tie, to, to uh, uh, counsel you, and, and they're not going to give you a spiritual counsel. I, and listen, uh, parents that are out of church, they can give some wise counsel. They can. But there are some matters that only, only God's going to be able to answer. We've got to have a right counselor. And so, uh, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners. Who, hey, if, if, you, if you lay down with dogs, you'll rise up with fleas. Uh, you, you, aren't, uh, you, uh, uh, you are who your friends are, or, or you soon will be. And then, uh, blessed is the man that, that sitteth not in the seat of the scornful. That's the crowd that wants to sit behind their laptop or their phone and, and provoke fights online and, and criticize everything everyone else is doing. And, and that's the, that's the shut Lighthouse Baptist Church down crowd. The crowd that's just doing everything they can to work against the work of God. And I'm saying to you that young people and adults, they've gotten with the wrong crowd at school, the wrong crowd in church, the wrong crowd in neighborhood, the negative crowd, the quitters crowd, the hateful crowd, and they look up in five years and they're no longer in church. We've got to have personal separation, not only with the crowd, but every one of us in this room has to have some personal standards. There's got to be some places that we won't go some music that we won't listen to, some people that we won't be around, some folks that we won't be around online, so, uh, some stuff that we won't allow in our home, uh, some things that we won't look at, some things that we won't wear. I, 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 I know I'm being very general with that, but, but friend, listen, you, you develop your standards, and, uh, but they need to be standards of safety. It's not always just, well, where does the Bible say that? I had a man in my church, I have several in my church that, that like to shave their head. They like to stay bald. Not on purpose. They, 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 they just like to cut their hair off. I had a man several years ago and he would shave his head bald. I said, you could grow hair. Why do you shave it bald? He said, because preacher, uh, whenever I was lost, he said, I was, I was lost. I was on the rock scene. And he said, my hair was so long. He said, I don't even want anywhere close to that anymore. Now, we, we can have some preferences and some standards, and we don't have time to preach on the specifics there. But, friend, listen to me. Uh, you don't have to just live your life based on, well, preacher, where does the Bible say that? Sometimes it's just safe. Sometimes it's just we don't have to, we don't have to ride that line in our home and say, well, I don't see anywhere in the Bible. It's against that. we got to think, but how is this going to affect my young people? How is this going to affect my testimony? And so we've got to have some personal standards. Young people, you, you're going to have some rules you're not going to understand, but your parents love you, and they're trying to raise you right and raise you in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And, 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 and don't fuck. Remember that, 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 that Solomon said to his, his son, my son, give me thine heart. And we need to keep our kids' heart. But young people, you have to give your parents your hearts. He said, my son, give me thine heart. Well, I don't understand. I'll give you an example. This is not, not trying to preach my standards. This is not my church. But, but when I was in eighth grade, I went to public school out in Wills Point. We didn't have a Christian school. I went to public school. And, and uh, the entire eighth grade class in that country town, maybe 100 kids, they were going to the movie theater. We had one movie theater, one screen in Wills Point. Well, my dad didn't let us go to the movies. I've often found that many of our preferences are things that were passed down to us from our, from our family. But my dad didn't let us go to the movies. And so the eighth grade class was going. It was some kind of Disney something, some rated G or whatever. And I went home and said, Dad, this was like the eighth grade going away party in the high school. He said, Son, I'm sorry. We don't go to the movies. 
I said, Dad, it's, it's, it's safe. Everyone's going. The teachers are going. It's just the eighth grade class. It's just a Disney movie. He said, son, I'm not going to lower my standards. We don't go to the movies. You know what I did as, a, as, a, as an eighth grader? I sat out on the playground and played basketball with the seventh graders all day long. That didn't feel good as, a, as an eighth grader, little seventh grade punks. That didn't feel good. In fact, I was embarrassed. I was upset. I was mad. But you know what? Looking back, I'm glad I had a dad that stood for something. I, I'm nobody. I have two brothers, a younger brother and an older brother. My younger brother turned 40 this week. My older brother is uh, 45, I believe, 44, 45. He's 45, I guess. I'm 43. And, uh, and we're, we're, we're all three different. And I had a, I had a goal. My, bro, my older brother will tell you, he, he, for about eight or nine years there, he was horrible. He was horrible as a teenager. And I made it a goal right then and there, young people. It's not in the notes. I don't know why the Lord has me saying it. But I made a goal right then and there. I said, I'm not going to break my parents' heart. I, I watched my dad as a pastor, and I said, I'm gonna, my dad's pastor in that church. My mom's burdened with it. They're burdened with it. I refuse to be a burden on their heart. And I wasn't a perfect kid, and still not, except when compared to those two. But I wasn't a perfect kid. But I just decided a long time ago, you know what? I'm giving my parents my heart, and I'll be a knucklehead from time to time, and i got to get a whipping from time to time, get grounded from time to time. But, friend, listen, we, we, we've got to have we've got to have some personal standards. And, and young people, it's not all just about what your parents do and don't let you do. It's got to, some of it's got to be, hey, you know, they may let you go a little further than what, what you say. That's, you know, my parents will let me do this, but it's just not safe for me. Adults, we've got to have some do's and don'ts. It just can't be, hey, kids, you do as I say. They ought to be able to do as we do. Paul said in, verse, uh, in uh, Philippians 4, those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. So mom and dad, guys and girls, we all have to have personal standards. We all have to say, you know what, there's some things I don't need to do. And you set them for yourself through prayer and through the reading of the Word of God. But you, it, you know, you, let me just throw this one out there because it's been an issue even in our church in recent months. You know if you're a grown adult and you're friends with someone on Facebook who's an old girlfriend or an old boyfriend. And you're playing it off like, no, we just went to school together. And that's what you're telling your spouse. And, but you know it's something more than that, and you're, and you're going to make an emotional connection or something if you're not careful. I'm just saying to you, that's the things we've got to think about. All right, I want to be in church in five years. Do you think anyone who's out of your church or my church today, completely out in the world, would have said five or ten years ago, I'm going to be completely out, of the world, out in the world in five or ten years? you think they would sit there and say, that's our goal? Not one. What happened? Somewhere along the line, maybe no personal standards. Maybe some standard they had, they lowered it a little bit. All right, so number one, if we're going to be unmovable, and in 10 years, I come back, and I'm visiting, and I say, man, I'm glad these folks are still in church. Uh, number one, uh, personal standards or personal separation. Uh, number two is this. All right, so he says, blessed is the man that walketh not in the council. Remember, this person is going to be like a tree. It's going to be a tree planted by rivers of water is unmovable. Uh, he says, Blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. He has some personal standards or personal separation. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate both day and night. Number one, we've got to have personal standards. Number two, we've got to have personal study. Personal study. If you came in on Wednesday night and said, Brother Grice, I haven't eaten. I haven't eaten since 2.30 on Sunday. He'd say, well, that's dumb. Are you fasting? I mean, that's spiritual. That's not dumb. Are you fasting three days? No, no I just haven't eaten. Why? Uh, because, I mean, since that lunch at church, nobody's, nobody's fed me. So you can't get your bowl of cereal out. You can't run down to Taco Bell. You can't feed yourself. Oh, I didn't think of that. But it's the same way whenever we wait for someone else to open the Bible for us. Remember, if we're going to be like a tree planted by rivers of water, I'm not moving. Number one, there got to be some boundaries in my life. I've got to have some do's and don'ts, and I've got to have them for myself, and I need to have them for my kids, and young people need to have them for yourself. And it's not always just, well, the Bible says this. Sometimes it's just, okay, you know, the Bible gives us a little leadway there, but I'm going to say just, I'm just going to stay back this far. So some personal standards, but then also some personal study. Again, we talked about it in Sunday school, but, but we've got to stop waking up and grabbing our phone first thing and start waking up and grabbing our Bible 
And I know that we have the Bible on our phone, and maybe that's what you use. And, and I just, there's something about that book right there. If I'm in a deer stand, I may read it on my phone. But, but there's just there's something about that book, having it uh, in your hand. Now, the Bible says, And in his law doth he meditate both day and night. So that's all day long. We're delighting in the Word of God. We're meditating upon the Word of God. To meditate means to dwell on anything in thought. We keep thinking about it. Uh, so day and night, I'm to dwell upon the Word of God in thought. That means I need to start the day in the Bible, and throughout the day, I'm thinking about what the preacher preached yesterday. I'm thinking about what I read this morning. I'm maybe listening to a preaching CD, and I'm just I'm getting filled with the Word of God. Now, he says in verse 2 that his delights in the law of the Lord, in his law doth he meditate both day and night. Doth he meditate both day and night. Joshua takes over from Moses. God says, Joshua, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. Listen, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. We'll come in on Sunday, preacher, fix me. And we'll take a couple of messages, and we'll try, and we'll pray, and we'll counsel, and we'll, and, and we'll preach. But the Bible says there, that I can make my marriage better. I can improve my parenting skills. I can get control of my child. I can fix my finances. I can help my attitude. But I've got to get in the Bible and read the Bible and think about the Bible and study the Bible and apply the Bible and, and live the Bible. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous and then thou shalt have good success. Someone once said this, learn the Bible while you are young. And when you are old, you will draw from it like a well of water. Learn the Bible. You should write this in your Bible. Learn the Bible while you're young. And when you're Pastor Grice's age, you will draw from it like a well of water. Did Sarah tell you she's having eye trouble? She, she, really, she really is. All right. Learn the Bible while you're young. When you're old, you'll dwell from it like a well of water. I don't purposely memorize scripture. Forgive me, I just, I just don't. I've never been, I've never just sat down. I've never been one that could win the, the memorized scripture trophies. I've never been one that could really, I remember back at Norris, Brother, uh, brother Coates, Brother Grice, I remember, I think it was Brother Rigsby, uh, but we, we had to memorize Isaiah 53. Who, who hath believed our report, to whom has the arm of the Lord revealed, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. I think I did like NIV every time I did the quiz because I would miss words and just, I'd just make it up. It, it wasn't word for word anymore, it was thought for thought. And, and, uh, but I've never been good at just memorizing. But I tell you what, and I, and, 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 and I know I don't, I don't always quote word for word, but, but when I'm preaching, I'll find myself throwing out a lot of scripture. And, I, and it's not written on my notes, a lot of it. I just, I just throw it out. You know where that comes from? It comes from just, just years of reading the Bible. You say, well, I'm not a good reader. Um, you think God knows that? He does. He knows that. I can give my wife a book, and she'll say, oh, that's a good book. And two weeks later, she'll say, man, that was an excellent book. She'll read it in a couple of weeks. You give me a book that looks like that right there, I'll come back at you in about six months. I'll read a page, I'll get bored, I'll go find the chapters with the headings that look good, you know, how to find the biggest buck, things like that. And, uh, and I'm just, I'm just, man. So you say, well, I don't read my Bible because I just, man, I, I haven't been to Bible college or I don't read fast or I don't understand uh, some of those words. Uh, friend, listen to me. You get in that Bible, God said, my word will not return void. Just get it open and say, God, open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. You don't even have to say it in the King James. You can just say, Lord, would you open my eyes, help me see today what I need to see from your word? And we have a God that loves us and that will feed us every day. Give us this day our daily bread. All right, so if we're going to be unmovable, we've got to have some personal standards, some personal separation. There are some people I don't need to be around. I'm not better than them, I'm not holier than thou, but I'm weak. And if I get around that crowd, I'm liable to become just like them. So I need to have some personal standards. Secondly, personal study. I need to stay in the Bible. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. Uh, thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. And the third one is this. Look in Psalm 1. All right, just not standing with the wrong crowd, sitting with the wrong crowd, and so forth. 
but he's studying the scriptures, his delights in the law of the Lord. Then in verse 3, he should be like a tree. There's that unmovable. Planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. That bringeth forth his fruit in his season. Uh, verse 4, the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Personal standards, personal study. Here's the third one. I think this is so important. I'll explain it and we'll be done. Personal service. Personal service. I have folks in my church that miss church all the time. Let me tell you why. They have no connection. There's not a bus route looking for them. There's not a Sunday school class looking for them. Many of them won't get involved because they don't want to be held accountable. And I'm saying that if you want to look up and be in the same place, you've got to get plugged in. You probably are. Sunday afternoon crowd after a good meal. We're all ready for a nap, ready to go to the bathroom. You're probably plugged in, but if you're not... Can I just leave you that personal service? I was talking to Brother Richard Way at that camp a couple of weeks ago, just chatting, and he had just had his church's five, his five year anniversary as pastor of that church down in Louisiana, South Louisiana. And he said on the day, on the day that he had his five years, it was the church's 42 years uh, as a church. And he said, Brother Jeremy, he said, I have a couple of people in our church that have been there all 42 years. He said they were in the nursery. And he said all 42 years they've been there. And that's really what sparked the thought for this message for my church is I want to be unmovable like that. Brother Grice, you, you would remember, some of you folks, uh, some of his family maybe would, would remember, but I, I remember over here at Trinity, I remember uh, Miss Lovell and Mrs. Uh, Marks. Miss, Miss, Miss Marks, I believe, was her name, but they kept the nursery every service, I think all three services. Yeah. I don't know how those women ever got preaching. I remember the speaker used to be on in there, and, and we would go back from time to time over the years as we grew up and maybe go back. We went to Mrs. Heath's funeral and other things, and you would go to that nursery, and Shane, Jeremy, and Sean, our picture was still up on that little board there. And we would go back there, and, and, and there would be some people who grew, who grew up that, that were in my dad's youth department. And you'd go back and say, man, this is so neat to see that, that 20 years later, people are still in church and still in the same church. And I'm saying that, that we ought to get that in our mind, that you know what? I want to be unmovable, unmovable. You say, well, I've jumped from place to place. I've jumped from ministry to ministry. I've jumped from this to that to that. Hey, from this point on, just say, you know what? I want to look up, be in the same place five years from now, ten years from now. Unless it's just the, wor unless it's just the will of God for me to move across the state of Texas or Cozumel or wherever the will of God may, may, may lead you at, uh, at some point. Uh, and, 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 but here's the thing. Let, let, let's, not, let's not move until... God moves. Years ago, a preacher was sitting with Lee Robertson, and uh, he was sitting in his office, and he was asking Dr. Robertson some questions, and the entire time he's asking Dr. Robertson the que some questions, Dr. Robertson's doodling on his desk like this, and he's thinking, man, he's not even listening to me. And he got done talking, and Dr. Robertson picked up his little piece of paper there, and he said, this is what it sounds like your life is right now. A big old question mark. He said, yes, sir, it is. Dr. Robertson wisely told that person, okay, then don't make a move until God answers those questions. Amen. Well, that's good. Until God just says, this is it. And guess what? Just because people didn't enjoy your pie at lunch and you heard about it, that's not God saying, well, I guess it's time to move. <laughs> and we laugh, but that's how petty we get sometimes. When I first started pastoring, I had, a, had an older lady I, I had a group of, uh, our church had gone through about three years of trial. When my dad left, I think it had gone down to about 105, 510 people. I successfully ran off 40 in the next two years. And one little grippy old lady, and you're not grippy just because you're an old lady, but this one was. There was a funeral, and she came, and she said, I can't find my cake pan. And I said, well, well, I'm sorry, because, you know, ladies, sometimes they'll take a pan home to wash it if you leave it or whatever. And, well, I'll never again bring up another cake to a, I wanted to tell her. The pastor in me was like, I wish you wouldn't feel that way. The inside of me was saying, nobody likes your stinking cake anyways. <laughs> Here's the thing. We have too many sensitive people in church today. We've let the world creep into the church. And, and we're sensitive about everything. We can't take a joke. We can't take correction. 
And so what we do is we say, well, you know, this is Grand Prairie. And you know Grand Prairie and Dallas and Arlington and Mesquite, a lot of churches. And I don't really like the fact Brother Grice corrected my kid who was acting like a dean bad at camp. So I just believe it's God's will to move on down the road. We need to just say, you know what? I'm going to be unmovable. If that man corrects me, if we butt heads, we can butt heads and still love one another and still pray about it and, and move on and roll on and it's over with. How to be unmovable, personal standards, personal study, and personal service, right? You got to make sure you're plugged in. There have been times, and I'm just about done, a couple minutes here, there have been times uh, back in 2008, I, I started pastoring in December 2000, and like I said, I, I successfully grew the church down to about 37 people. Our lowest Sunday was a 37 people in, in two years. I mean, it was, God was cleaning house. But then after that, it started rebuilding, and, and uh, it, it, it began to really take off, and church, church growth is like this. It's kind of it's plateau growth, and, and sometimes you'll lose a few. They'll retire. They'll move away. They'll die. They'll quit, whatever. So it's kind of up and down. You, you, you get a few families, and you lose one or two, and it, it really began to take off. Well, it was, it was at its greatest uh, in 2008 at that point, and I felt like God was moving me to start a church, and it was, it was so... So obvious to me uh, that it was, and I got some counsel from an older preacher friend uh, up north, and, and he basically pulled that thing on me about, sounds like you have a lot of questions, don't make any moves at, until the questions are answered. So I didn't, and I'm glad, because after that, within a couple of years, we lost three folks really close to us in our church. Young lady died of leukemia. It was a time where it was like, I'm glad they didn't have a new pastor to come in here who didn't really have a relationship with folks. So it was obvious that, that God wasn't in, in the move. And there, there, had been a, there, there had been probably just one really major time in the fall of 2010, I was ready to be done. I was just done. I was sick of people. We had some junk with one family basically in our church, voted them out of the church, voted two families out of the church. And I was just sick of it. I was done. I was ready to go learn how to fly fish and just move up to northwest Arkansas and do some fly fishing. Let me tell you why. What one of the, my wife certainly and kids kept me from doing something that dumb. But the other thing was I thought, you know, for all the stubborn adults I deal with, there are a bunch of young people running around our church that that love the Lord, that want to serve the Lord, that want to grow up right. And what if their pastor, who's been their pastor, some of them since birth, what if all of a sudden he quits? What's going to happen to those young people? That's why I'm saying to you, if you're not plugged into this church, get plugged in. Find you a place of ministry. Find you a place where on Sunday you can't wake up and just say, you know, I... You wake up and you say, where's my Sunday school lesson? I'm out the door. I cannot wait to teach. You wake up and say, Pastor, where's the van keys? Where's the bus keys? Where's the whatever? I'm ready to serve the Lord. So if we want to be unmovable, we want to look up, and in five years and 10 years and 15 years from now, we're still in the same place. We've got to have some personal standards. If we live recklessly, we're going to wreck our life. Uh, we've got to have some personal study. It can't just be what I get at church. I need to meditate upon the Word of God, think about it throughout the week, apply it to my life, and it needs to be some personal service. There needs to be a reason I show up. If it's just that I show up to see the yard that I mowed this week, if I show up to make sure the light bulbs are not out, thank God for the folks that serve in the kitchen back there during lunch. Those are the real servants of the church that will do that kind of stuff and then get up here and lead the singing and those sorts of things. But not everyone's the preacher. Not everyone's the missionary. Not everyone's Everyone's a song leader, but we need folks to make sure the lights are still working. We need folks to make sure the restrooms are clean. We need folks to teach the classes. We need folks to clean the baptistry. We need folks to run the sound booth. And I'm saying every member of this church ought to say, I'm going to be plugged in somewhere. I want to be missed when I'm gone. And if you do that, on those days where you feel like, eh, you'll think, I don't want to let the Lord down. I don't want to let my preacher down. I don't want to let those kids down. I have a purpose in being at that church. And I think you'll look up and you go, wow, I've been teaching five years now, preacher. Wow, man, I've been mowing that yard six years. I've been taking care of these flowers. I've been dusting these lights now. Oh, it's been eight or nine years. Man, time flies. That's better than no standards, no separation, blending in, and you just fall apart. It's better than no Bible. It's better than no place of service. And it's just kind of we're in, we're out, we're up, we're down. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be you steadfast, unmovable. Just stay 
where God has you. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for our time. And I pray, Lord, that we would take the thought from your word to heart today. We're so thankful for the rapture, and we hear it so much that sometimes we forget it could happen at any moment. Until that day, you tell us, stay busy. But if we're going to stay busy for you, we've got to be unmovable. We can't constantly change. And so, Lord, I pray that those three things we see out of Psalm 1 today will be a challenge to us. Some of us maybe need to strengthen our standards of separation. And we're, we're playing with fire. We're, we're doing things online. We are around people at school, uh, at work, that are, they don't talk the same as us. They don't believe the same as us. They're leading us down a wrong path. And God, I pray today that you've revealed that to some of us. Or some of us need to get back to personal study. Uh, we have personal social media, but we don't spend a whole lot of time with personal study in the Word of God. And maybe today there's some to make that commitment. And then personal service. I don't know this crowd. The faithful crowd is here on a Sunday afternoon. But Lord, some of them maybe are faithful to church, but really don't do much uh, around here. And Lord, may they find something, some way to serve you just behind the scenes. Do something to serve you through your local church so that they feel appreciated, feel wanted, feel needed, and, uh, and they, they uh, feel accountable. And we'll be here week in and week out until you come back for us again. Bless, I pray in Jesus' name.